hello, Jason. My name is Philip. Welcome to Ajko TV, and hey, thank you for having us. Uh, you're in North Carolina right now. Is that true? Yeah, we got in uh, early this morning. We're playing in Raleigh, North Carolina today. So um, I was I was looking for some information, and I was able to find out that uh, there's about six hours time difference from Prague here. And let me start with a maybe uh, a little different question. Is six hours too much time or too little time to write a Sum 41 song? <laughs> it can be done, but uh, that seems a little bit little, <laughs> little time, but it's been done. Uh, I'm asking because I've read somewhere that your original drummer, Steve, wrote Pain for Pleasure in 10 minutes while he was sitting on a toilet. Is that true? <laughs> Yeah, that is that is true. I mean, the mu music was, was written pretty quickly too. We were in a studio in Toronto, and we just had this funny idea to do this metal song. And Steve was going to sing it, so he went to the he went to the bathroom for I don't know. I I, I want to say it was like 12 minutes. I wrote the lyrics, the pain for pleasure came out. Like I got it, went into the vocal booth and sung it. So yeah, that song definitely under six hours. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And uh, was it like a bet or something, or was it just some kind of spur of a moment? Or no, no, it, we were. It was super spur of the moment. We were. Uh, I don't. I can't really remember, but I think we were just joking around about uh, putting some kind of metal song, Iron Maiden type song, on the album. And Steve wanted to, you know, obviously we we're like, you should sing it, and. So he just went in, he had to go to the washroom anyway. <laughs> so he went in with a notebook and just wrote the words. That's awesome, man. Um, uh, is, your, uh, is your sound check in, in plan for today or have you already done it? Yeah, we're going to sound check in about an hour. We sound check around 2, 2.30 every day. I'm trying to switch to uh, your cooperation and mental connection on the stage because uh, according to your last interview for billboard um there was a there was a saying that uh, you are mentally in tune with each other like uh, like never before and i would like to ask you what do you think uh what does it take for to be mentally in tune for a band of your format uh i think You know, because we we've been such good friends for so long, I think we really we know each other really well. Like I've always said, like if especially you know, obviously Zumo we've known for um, I guess eight years now, and and Tom a little longer. But you know, Derek, Dave, and I went to high school together, so we've known each other since we were 14. You know, it's one of those things. Like one of the you know, if Derek walks into a room or Dave walks into a room, I can without them saying anything, I can kind of tell their mood because I know them so well. So I think over the years, we've just kind of learned to give each other space if, if we need space on the road, because, you know, these long tours can get grueling and you get tired and, you know, it's, it's not, you're not always in a, in a, in a good mood all the time out on tour as, as much as maybe people think we are. It's like, we are, we're having a good time. The shows are amazing. We love playing live, but then there's stuff off stage that you have to deal with. And right now, I think it's the best we've all ever gotten along for a long, long time. And it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, your, uh, your latest records uh, shows for it, definitely. It sounds awesome. Uh, but I would like to uh, get a little Thank back uh, because uh, this is your last tour ever. It feels weird to say that. <laughs> uh, I would like to get back to All Killer, No Filler because uh, your, your two biggest songs uh, today, Fat Lip and Into Deep, uh, are there. And I have a bit of a nerdy question. Um, I have read that this record was produced by Jerry Finn. And Jerry Finn, uh, in my opinion, was a, such a big influence on bands like Blink-182, Green Day, MXPX, and The Offspring, and so many more. And I would like to ask you if you think that Jerry left some influence on Sum 41 in the long run as well. Oh, 100%, without question. Um, you know, Jerry, he wasn't uh, a musician, but he had this ear and he knew what was good. And he could say to you, like, if you came up with a part or if Derek wrote a verse or a chorus or a riff or anything like that, he could say, that's not good enough. 
tr- keep going, like keep, keep trying. So mm. he had this like ear that not a lot of people have. Plus he, he knew how to get great sounds. He knew how to make the studio fun. Um, you know, every day in the studio with Jerry was just fun. It was just, he, he had this way of lightening the mood in the studio all the time, every day. So we just, the whole process was really fun. I think we took that away from that process and we took, you know, there's stuff that I still use on bass now. Like there's a, there's a DI that Jerry had way back when we were recording that album that I still use today. (laughs) It's called the evil twin. You can't even get it anymore. Um, and so there's stuff like that. And, and the bass that Jerry had, I still record with that same kind of bass. And, you know, Derek's the same, like he had, he uses amps that Jerry had, um, so there's there's stuff that we still record with to this day because you can I can listen to All Killer No Filler and be like I could tell that we had a fun time doing this. It wasn't we weren't over analyzing everything. We weren't saying like it's not complicated enough. It was it's a pretty basic album, and I think that's why it's good. And I think Jerry knew that. And would you say uh, what is more important to have fun or or to be nerdy with stuff and like re-record everything three times? What's more important to you? I, you know, you can get nerdy, you know, you can get into gear, obviously sounds are obviously a big part of being in the studio and getting the right sounds, the right tones. But when you can have fun in the studio and you can kind of relax a little bit and just let everything come to you and not overanalyze everything and just knowing like that part, you, that's good. Let's move on instead of like trying to sit there and make it perfect, you know, I, I'm not really big on like trying to make it perfect, perfect all the time. I don't, I think this band has caught, gotten over that as well. It's just like, if you can listen back and say like, that sounds good and it's good, let's move on. Uh, um, so I think Jerry was big on that too. He didn't sit down and analyze everything and be like, well, you kind of missed the beat on this. And if he, if he listened to it and said, that sounds great, let's just, let's just keep going. Um, that's, that's a big thing in the studio. I'm so glad to hear that because uh, I think sometimes in these modern days, uh, artists and bands uh, tend to overlook this fact that the performance and the song comes first. And it, it's great that, that you are confirming that. Um, yeah. Now, I would like to fast forward to Chuck. And uh, here's my uh, here's my question that I, I wanted to find out uh, for a long time. And I guess if I was searching, uh, if I would be searching uh, on Google for a little more time, I would probably find out uh, the answer. But I would like to ask you personally, because uh, on album Chuck, there was this uh, Japanese uh, Japanese special uh, version, and there was a song, uh, my personal favorite of all time by Sum 41 called Subject to Change. And uh, from now on, you probably know where that question is going, because uh, there's this epic chorus, which appeared about three years later as a chorus of the single Underclass Hero. And I would like to know the story behind that. How did that happen? Yeah, I think because uh, Subject to Change was only kind of released probably in Japan. I, I don't know. Maybe it was released in other places. And it was a bonus track. I think we all felt like that chorus was too good not to like make it a real song and give it a real release. And at that point we couldn't just, I guess we could have, but I guess we didn't feel like we could take subject to change and just put it on the next album. So we just took the course and it's a little different. I think, I think subject to change, I haven't heard time, but I think it would, and under, under class heroes in a major key, which is some nerdy, yeah, nerdy yeah. stuff, but Derek wrote a little, Derek wrote a different verse and which became under class hero and a riff and, We didn't really think too much about it. I think um, fans of ours thought more into it than we did. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying that bonus tracks, because uh, I have read that you had a lot of uh, bonus tracks and different alternate versions on, on your releases, on your records. Uh, so do you feel like these bonus tracks are not like uh, full songs, like like songs, songs? You know what I mean? No. No, not necessarily. I just think that um, I think because it was only released in a certain region, and I, you know, like I said, I haven't heard "Subject to Change" in a while, but I remember liking that song. But I think because we released that, and we like thought, like, wow, that chorus is really good. It really, it really could have went on Chuck. It, it probably should have went on Chuck. Like, like we feel about Newts. There's a song called Newts that we all say, like, Derek and I were talking about it the other day, and we thought wow, we really should have put Newt's on Chuck because we re- all really like the song. 
Um, but I think I thought I think we just thought it was a waste. That's just that's just song specific. So no, when we release bonus tracks, um, we all like it. Like we all think they're real songs and they're they're gonna you know they're just bonus tracks mm. to a certain region in the world because you know when we do an album. A lot of countries like Japan or uh, like the UK or something like that, they like the record company likes to add bonus tracks for those regions. So we always need to have something in our back pocket. Would you describe Sum 41 as a pop punk legend? I don't even know if I describe Sum 41 as pop punk. Um, so that's a tough question. I always had like Sum 41 in my head uh, labeled as a, as a pop punk big name and and all the american pie movies around it and stuff like that i think that that counts as as a legend right yeah you know that is something for her to decide and i think the label pop punk came because that was you know when you come out as a new band uh the when people are writing writing about you in magazines and they're talking about you on tv as you are uh people need to describe you as something for people that don't mm. know and i think They have to give you a label of some sort. And for whatever reason, people thought Sum 41 at that point, if all killer, no filler and half hour power, they are pop punk. And from that moment on, we were a pop punk band, even though in our career, we've done more heavy music than we've done pop punk music. We don't really care about labels. We never call ourselves. So we just we always stick to like the rock label. We're a rock band and we do punk music. We do some metal. We do some pop music and. And, uh, you know, as for legendary status, I, I don't, again, that's kind of like, I would never, I would never say like, we're a legendary band, you know, that's, <laughs> that's something for the media to decide and, and for fan and for fans to decide, you know, if fans decide that we're a legendary band, then sure, <laughs> we'll, we'll take it. And, uh, do you personally feel, uh, your heart being, uh, being pulled more by the heavier music or the let's call it pop punkish music more uh i would say like i i love the evolution of our band because i really loved half hour power and all killer no filler when it came out um and as we got heavier with does look infected a little bit a little bit darker and then chuck i we all were like feeling that we were feeling like we wanted to make that music and so i like the evolution of our band um i think through the years i steered towards As I got older, I think I steered towards the heavier stuff. But I will say, I had such a blast at doing Heaven and Hell, our new album, because the Heaven side is kind of back to the pop punk, mm -hmm. and the Hell is kind of the metal side. But I, I love the Hell side, but I really had a lot of fun do, doing that Heaven side pop punk stuff again. And when I listen back to it, I love it. Like I, I love that sound, <clears throat> and I've I've always had a I've always loved that sound of Sum 41. By the way, we are very much looking forward to a performance here in Czech Republic on Rock for People. Uh, do you do you know, do you remember this festival? Because you have played there several times, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I have seen you. I have seen you there, uh, uh, there when I was like 14 years old or something, and it was it was a great show. <laughs> yeah, it was at the same show. I think we were on Screaming Bloody Murder, and I think the barricade broke in the front, Ooh. and there was a bunch of like. Fire, tr or fire department had to come, police officers, we had to stop the show. You remember, <laughs> is that the one? I just remember the the pulsating energy and, and like your band just crushing it and seeing uh, seeing my idols <laughs> on, on, the, on these stages. And that was the only thing I was focusing for, but I was standing really in the back. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure about these fire trucks. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, there was, uh, there's actually some footage. We, re we released some footage about that on a, video um, i think it was really the first time we ever played in czech republic was that rock for people festival and yeah the barricade had snapped because everyone was pushing so forward <laughs> that uh yeah the, the police had to come and the fire department was there and it was wild on your last tour tour of the setting some by the way i very much appreciate the pun and now that you are visiting all these different cities uh are you like oh do you remember the first time we played here it happened this and that are you are you getting nostalgic during this tour a little bit a little bit i think it comes up more during like interviews if people ask about certain things and you know we've actually you know it's fun i think the, one of the most fun things for me is Uh, having people come to the shows that I haven't seen in a long, long time, like um, people from our past, like we had 
uh, Rob Stevenson come, came to the New York City sh show, and Rob Stevenson was the guy who signed Sum 41 in 1999. Mm. And I hadn't seen him. We hadn't seen him in 20 years. Uh, since he like basically left the label when we were still on it, I hadn't seen him since then. And he came to the show to see the show. And man, it's, it was so, uh, it was, I would say it's weird. <laughs> it was weird because, you know, you're seeing these people that we used to be around all the time. Uh, but yeah, you know, we'll sit around once in a while and, and reminisce on certain things on the bus and stuff comes up, stories come up. And so, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we're not doing it all the time, but it, it, it comes up from time to time. Since this is your last tour, can you imagine starting a band from scratch just like the old times? I mean, no technicians, no stagehands, no, uh, I mean, loading vans yourself and playing small clubs for, I don't know, 50 or 100 people. Uh, is this a phase of your bands or, or, or you as a musician's journey? Is this something uh, that you cherish in your memories? Yeah, I would be opposed to doing that again. Um, if something good really came up, if I felt passionate about it, I, I've no, I've, um, I don't think I would care about like doing all that kind of stuff again. Um, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what I'm going to really do after. I haven't, I'm trying not to think about that kind of stuff right now. Something will probably come up uh, once it's nearing the end. But yeah, I mean, those days, those days of us being in a van, playing in front of five people a night, um, <laughs> it's hard to believe like, you know, it's hard to believe that that actually went on and it, it seems long ago, but it also seems not too long ago. So it's like, I remember, uh, lugging my bass amp upstairs to clubs and, you know, and, and, and driving through snowstorms in a van and chaining our tires to get there. And, uh, you know, showing up to a venue and like knowing that there's only like three people that bought tickets and that's all <laughs> stuff that, um, I think made our band, who we are today. And I think we had to go through all that to get to where we are now. And I think that's what's maybe missing a little bit in, in modern music is bands really slugging it out of vans and, and just playing wherever you can play in front of whoever you can play for. And we did all that. And we, I think that's how we got better as a band because we just played a lot in front of whoever it didn't matter. So I think that's how we came, we got from like a high school band into like a real band. Plus one for the legendary status. Okay, Jason, uh, I have so many more questions to ask that uh, I would like to know, but uh, the time's up. I would really, uh, I would really, I want to thank you for uh, taking taking the time of your schedule to uh, to have a conversation. And I wish you luck on your last tour, and we'll see each other at Rock for People. Awesome! Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs>